Okay, perfect. So we're going to get going here. We are uh, starting, and uh, what I want to do is welcome you to this webinar. It is on money, and I'm going to give you some of the, uh, the cool things that I've learned about money and just some basic tips that you can start using to really transform your lives because money is a very, very complicated subject. It's, it's I mean, you know, it's just such an emotional subject, and yet people know so little about it. And it's so important. Everyone, every day, uses money. So uh, I've kind of loosely covered, um, I titled this, What Nobody uh, Told You About Money Before. But it's going to go into a lot of different directions. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of, of, of some things, some of them controversial, and some of them, uh, you know, more basic, but just, you know, practical things that, uh, that you need to know. So a little introduction here. Um, here's what we're going to cover. Uh, first off, if I mention any you know kind of investing or or anything like that, uh, I'm not licensed to recommend any investments. I'm just telling you my own personal opinion and what I'm doing. You know, so you might want to check this with your financial advisor, and and you know that's all well and good. Uh, you're ultimately responsible for your own decisions. So if you're okay with that, then uh, uh, then let's move forward. Basically, I'm going to go through my story. Um, I'm going to do a, 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 an overview, and then we're going to go into part one. I got some uh, some pretty cool content here in, in the first section, um, and then I'm going to go into some practical steps you can use to actually, um, you know, start making some some financial changes in your life. We'll be talking a little bit about gold and silver, some very cool things uh, about that because I think that that's really important. And then in part two, I'm going to go into some, into some more. I guess more controversial items about uh, about money. Um, I'm also going to give you some critical thoughts on investing, okay, um, which is very important. And then I'm going to go through the seven levels in, of investors. And everyone on this call will be in one of these, you know, uh, seven different levels. Um, so it's important to to do that. And I'm going to leave you with some action steps. So why don't we just kind of get right uh, right into it? Um, a little bit about me. My name is Andrew Murray. Um, I'm 34 years old. I'm entrepreneurial, and I never really wanted to work for anyone else. You know, uh, I remember when I was very young, I told my uh, my mother that I wanted to be a house a house soldier. You know, so I could just kind of stay at home and and not have to go and and uh, go into the workforce because that was something that 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 never really interested me. And uh, I was introduced to network marketing. It intrigued me, and I definitely liked the idea of, of having. Uh, my own business and having the low overhead. And from there, Marie and I, we, we naturally moved into doing some real estate, um, some affiliate marketing, and creating our own products and you know some, some other ways to, uh, to make money. Uh, I bought my first house at 21, and since then I've owned five houses, either, either my own that I've lived in or rental properties. And like most people, you know I've lost money on some, uh, renters not paying, you know, uh, mistakes that I've made, uh, renovating mistakes. You know, we've uh, uh, we totally redid one one of our houses. You know, um, so you know we've done full scale renovations as well, and uh, I've also done very well. You know, in uh, in real estate, I made uh, six figure profits from selling real estate in a time market. And um, I've also made six figures, you know, starting in 2005 when I was 28, and I've really done that every every year since, you know, six or, or multiple six figures. And when I started getting huge profits from real estate, you know, I didn't really know what to do with it, and so I I ended up blowing several hundred thousand dollars, um, you know, which I think a lot of people can relate with. I mean, you know, one of the problems is people can make mistakes with money. Uh, I went to a seminar uh, that talked about money, and there were people there who really understood money. Uh, they talked about how it takes three generations to, you know, really amass generational wealth, and how in one generation, boom, someone who doesn't understand it can lose it all, um, and th there's no going back. Uh, so I became very interested at that point in what the wealthy were doing with their money, how they invested, and, you know. You know, I actually became obsessed with that. Found it fascinating. You know, because they were doing different things, and there was this disparity between what, you know, people were 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 uh, doing who were very wealthy, and what, you know, smart money or you know some of these financial magazines were were telling people to do. There was a huge disparity, and 
you know, I was very interested in that. Now, I come from a well-to-do family. Um, I actually have a university that, that's named after my family here in Canada uh, on my maternal side. Um, but I still didn't have a very good education on what to do with money. So I went on my own quest. I learned about different investments. I learned about what inflation was. You know, before it was always just some word. That, What's that? What are these people talking about? Um, I learned what the government does with our money, um, why opportunities arise when the economic climate is down, and how to be prepared for that, what to look for. Um, you know, I learned about investing in different things that, that were not normal, you know, not what you know, traditional people invest in. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of value in that, in thinking contrarian in terms of everything, you know, um, uh, you know, in terms of the media, in terms of politically, in terms of, you know, economically. It's very important to really, you know, kind of think for yourself. Um, I, I really, really believe that. And, you know, there are so many opportunities online to increase your earning potential. You know, and, and once you do that, once you start earning money, you need to know how to invest it properly or else you'll never have that passive income lifestyle. So it's really about getting money to work for you. So, um, so we're going to talk about passive income and how to really get that working for you. Let's, uh, let's get going here. In, in the, the overview here, I, I really want to cover two principles that are really the foundation for this whole course. Uh, one, there are shortcuts to becoming wealthy, and two, wealthy people invest differently. They do different things. And if you understand that, then you can be looking for the right you know, solutions. It'll be very interesting when we get to the, the, the seven levels of investors over here because you know, I think a lot of people are going to be uncomfortable with, with, with where they see themselves. Um, so again, this is just, just really about, uh, about money. So let's get right into it. Let's get into to part one. Okay, first off, most marriages break up over finances. It's very, very important that you understand how to manage money. And surprisingly, you know, people just really don't know about money, which, which they use and they, they actually depend on every single day. Um, you know, money is not a video game. And what I mean by that is, you know, we live in a culture where it's very easy to kind of be in a video game and, 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 and play your character and then, you know, get shot and die and then just, you know, start a new game or, you know, a lot of, a lot of arcade games, you know, you get killed and then you just press a button and you just pop back up. You know, you throw 25 cents back in the, in the machine. Um, and that's a kind of culture that I think, you know, people are moving more towards, you know, that kind of thing. And you have to realize that money is not a video game, okay? The impact that you make with a bad financial decision can last for decades, okay? And I'm not exaggerating when, the, when I put, you know, plural on the end of that decades. It's so important. Most people make mistakes because they're not taught about this. You know, we're taught in school very linear thinking, you know, where you're, you know, uh, basically repeating something, <laughs> memorizing, um, you know, that kind of thing. You're not really taught, you know, even how to balance a checkbook, you know, for example. Uh, so it, it, it's important. Now, here's another principle, okay? Wealth is not created or destroyed, okay? It really is, um, a lot of things can happen to it. It can be transferred, it can be taxed, it can be stolen. It can be misused and it can also be gained, okay? But the point is, is that wealth is not really created, okay? It's, it, it, it's always in, in, in ebb and flow. It's not something you can just wrap your head around, okay? And I, I think we're moving into a time where it's going to start moving faster and faster, and that's why it's important to really understand this stuff. And also, um, there, are, there are different cycles of wealth, okay? Um, I've read some books, some books that were very out of date, you know, that, that talked about money, and they talk about things in a much different way. You know, I'm thinking maybe, you know, um, uh, you know, Nothing Down Real Estate by, by Robert Allen, you know, or, or something like that. And the way that it talks about some of that stuff is, you know, very different. And what I want you to understand is while there are all these different cycles going in here, and, and, and I'm not going to be talking about, um, uh, you know, what particular cycles are, are moving right now so much, but I want you to realize that there are shortcuts. You know, the Elevation Group, which I've been uh, sending emails about to, uh, to my list and something that I really believe in, is a shortcut, you know, if you want to get there faster. So, you know, that's, that's the, uh, the principle. You know, wealth cannot be created or destroyed. You just need to have, find where it's going to be flowing to you, 
Okay, and, and that's really important. So the stages of money. Okay. And I'm just going to move that over there. Stages of money. Okay, first, first stage is the basics. Okay, this is the kind of if you go to a bookstore and you get a basic book on like money management, something like maybe Dave Ramsey or you know traditional stuff that says, hey, you know, put some money in in, in a 401k, um, you know, that kind of thing. Automatic investing. You know, David Bach. Okay, that's a very basic type of book. Now it's important to go through that. It's important to understand that. But you have to realize. You can't just stop there, okay? That will not get you anywhere close to, to where you really need to go. But it is important that you have to know the basics, um, you know, and, and a lot of people don't. Um, stage two is really mindset, okay, where you're starting to understand about psychology. And this is critical when you get into investing. If you don't understand psychology, you're going to lose a lot of money. And I think when people start, you know, getting into investing and, and, and you know, the stock market and whatnot, you need to realize that you know some of what you're putting in you're going to lose and that's the price of your education okay there's two ways to, to do education one is by having someone teach you and and paying for it that way the other is by making mistakes so I like the idea of making uh, uh, mistakes that you are prepared to make okay so realizing that you're going to make some mistakes and walking into it knowing that I think that's important to uh, to recognize because it, it, it can get complicated uh, number two is self-discipline, understanding about having to have self-discipline around money. And uh, becoming wealthy actually requires, and, and, and a lot of things, you know, if you talk to business owners, uh, which I do a lot, delay, delaying of, of gratification, which I, I really think is, you know, probably one of the foundations of, of our culture and one of the reasons why humans have been able to, to evolve and have been such a, um, uh, uh, you know, why we've had such an interesting culture. Um, I think that's super important, and it's definitely important in, in terms of money. You know, if you can't control your urge to buy something, then you know you're probably not gonna gonna ever become wealthy. And then stage three is action. Okay, and the, the, the really there's two actions. I think if, if you really want to become wealthy, you have to do one of two things. You either have to inherit money, or you have to own a business. Okay. Um, now notice I didn't say work on a business. You have to own it. Okay. So. For most people, that's going to be you know starting their own business, uh, whether that's online with a lot of what I do in terms of network marketing, internet marketing, creating your own products, you know, or whether that's a brick and mortar type of business, which I'm sure a lot of the other people on the line uh, have started as well. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the cash flow quadrant. Okay, this is something where um, uh, Robert Kiyosaki talks about, and he broke he broke everything down into, into these four stages. One is employee, okay, which is what our school system is really geared to, to teach people to, uh, uh, to turn into. And then people, you know, uh, who are starting to move out of that and, and, and become more action oriented, you know, then they start to move into something where it's, where it's self-employed. And this is, you know, salespeople. You can be even a high paid salesperson and be in this quadrant where you're really self-employed. And the key metric you need to look at is if you need to, to, to work for money. Okay, and if you need to actually go into work, then you're self-employed. You know, when I started making a multiple six-figure income through a home business, I thought I was in the B quadrant, but I really wasn't. I was really in the self-employed quadrant because when I stopped working, I didn't get paid anymore. So that's important to, to understand. And then you want to move into the into the B quadrant. And as you become more and more wealthy. I think there's a there's a line where it goes E S, you know, B I. Uh, generally, in most cases, and B is really about systems. You know, if you read the E Myth or a book like that about business, you realize that being a business owner is really all about systems and having people do the work for you. So you're not always doing the work, um, and and this is really important to uh, uh, to understand. When you get to the I, the investor, that's where your money works for you. Okay, and that's very different because that's where you really get well both of these you can get passive income, but this is this is you know the ultimate. This is this is really what you know um, uh, the goal of the elevation group is is really to, to do is to fill that hole because there's a big hole. I mean people really don't know how to uh, how to do that. So this is a this is a really important thing. I mean one of the one of the criticisms that, that I have with Robert Kiyosaki stuff 
is, you know, when it comes to investing, he's extremely vague about what you should be doing. And um, that's what I want to kind of get into here. Now, practical steps, these are pretty much uh, a little bit more basic, okay? But, you know, I just came up with these off the top of my head to really understand or, or to really kind of suggest what's important. Because I know a lot of people, I work with a lot of people in network marketing, and they don't really treat their business like a business. So the first thing is to reduce your credit card debt. Um, and recognize also that business credit is different from personal credit. If you have a credit card that's for a business that, that can be used to grow your business, that's very different from having personal debt where you go into debt because you buy a big TV you know, or, or, or something like that. Um, but when you reduce it, you know, what you're really trying to do is, is, is minimize, you know, a lot of the, the detritus in your life. Um, one of the things I've noticed is, you know, when you simplify things, it's much, much better. Um, point number two, owning a business is the only way to accumulate wealth quickly. Okay, one of the things, of, uh, the difference between an employee and a business owner is the business, businesses are always set up so that the person doing the work, the employee, is paid as little as possible so they won't complain, and all the profits are going to flow into the business owner. And if that's a small business, that means it's all going to you. If it's a, a public business, that means it's going to the shareholders. You know, um, But it's that profit margin that can grow quicker than, than linearly. So if you stay as an employee, and that's all you do, you can only increase your income linearly. And I think we're moving into an area where we're going to see a lot of inflation. That's going to be very, very difficult for, uh, for people. And as I say here in point three, employees can only get rich slowly. Okay, So you definitely don't want to do that. Now, it's worth time. It's worth spending time building a business. Okay, And if you're building an Internet business, I would say expect to spend at least three years until you're really a master at it, until you, you, you really grasp it. Okay, and that's on average. Um, you know, some people do it a lot quicker. Some people take longer. But you have to understand, you know, much like, you know, investing. If you're going to take control of it, it's not like you just jump in and you just start doing stuff, um, you know, without really knowing what you're doing, and you start seeing some set, some some success. You're going to need to put some time into it, into really mastering it. Now, what I do for my business is I have basically two shoe boxes. They're they're not really shoe boxes, but I have one for my business credit card receipts and one for my cash receipts. And I give those to my accountant. And the reason I keep the cash receipts separate is because she's got to total all that stuff up, you know, um, because it's all tax deductible, like when I go out for coffee or, or, or you know, stuff like that. Um, so that's just what I do, you know, but you want to get it done and, and be organized on this so you can get it out of, um, you know, it's not clogging up stuff. And then when, it's, when your, your taxes are done, just put it all in a, in a folder. Um, you know, or a big manila envelope and, you know, stash it for seven years in your, uh, in your basement. Um, I also recommend you consolidate all your expenses, if you can, on as few cards as possible. So if you can do one card, that's great. I mean, I'm a Canadian, so I have a U.S. credit card, and if I buy things in the U.S., I try to, try to uh, uh, use that, you know, over the, uh, over the Internet if it's a business expense. And then when I'm you know, doing stuff where, um, you know, I'm going to, to, to Staples or buying business supplies, I put that on, a, on my Canadian credit card. And that makes sense for me. But you basically want to consolidate things because then you're tracking less things. One of the, one of the things that I learned from Peter Drucker is he said that what's get, what gets measured gets managed, okay? And if you're not measuring it, you have no way to, uh, to manage it. So that's pretty important. And then there's a cool site called Mint.com which will track your expenses and even your income, uh, including PayPal, automatically. You just go in there and tag it, and then you can, you can again, you know, you're measuring it so you can start to manage it so you can see how much you're spending. You know, how much are you spending on your outsourcers? You know, how much are you spending on your, your, your pay-per-click campaigns? And, you know, then you can really decide if it's, um, if it's worth it. So those are just a few practical steps. Um, now I want to get into, you know, some of the more... Uh, more meaty parts of this presentation where we're going to be talking about uh, gold and silver. Okay. First off, you know, you have to understand, you know, gold and silver are real money. And a lot of people like to like to uh, uh, confuse this 
But keep in mind that, you know, let's say the government has a vested interest to perpetuate the myth that gold and silver are not, are not real money. Um, and the reason is, is because gold and silver is a competitive currency to the U.S. dollar, you know, or to the Canadian dollar, or, you know, any fiat currency, right? Um, you know, because the dollar is based on the good faith and trust of the U.S. government. And gold and silver is a threat to that, okay? Because gold and silver can't be manipulated. You know, governments like to have a currency that can be easily manipulated, that can be, you know, increased, um, that can be printed, you know, for, for very little cost. You can't print gold and silver. You need to dig it out of the ground, and there are real hard costs for doing that. You need to refine that. So you can't just run the printing presses and, you know, print a bunch of, of you know, green paper um, or, or, or that kind of thing. So it's important to understand that. Now, what is inflation? Okay, inflation is a hidden tax on the people. Definition of inflation is inflation is the loss of constant purchasing power of the dollar caused by an increase out of thin air of the supply of money and debt creation by the financial system. Okay, so it's basically a loss of your purchasing power. And it's insidious because most people don't really understand what's happening. Okay, they just get... They just think mil the price of milk is going up, you know, the price of eggs is going up, or the cost of heating is going up, or the cost of housing is going up. And they don't really understand what's happening and why it's happening. Now, the other thing you have to realize is inflation numbers, well, I'll get to this a little bit later, but, you know, they're kind of misstated. You know, um, they, they, you know on news they say about the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, they're not really accurate with, with a lot of these numbers. It's much easier for the government to tax people using inflation than to raise the tax rates, okay? Because most people won't even understand they just got taxed. People aren't going to complain about it. And, you know, to be a little jaded, I mean, the Republicans are going to talk about, you know, tax rates and um, uh, all that stuff. But it's hard for them to kind of fight on inflation because it's such a it's such an indefined thing and you'll see I mean how how different it is um, you know actually if we go to uh, uh, to shadow stats actually I should have uh, uh, should have popped this into the uh, the webinar let me go there now all right and and just show you quickly what we're talking about here um, and basically, this is uh, by John Williams, Shadow Stats. Um, you'll see the, the alternative uh, inflation rate, you know, much, much different, um, you know, than, uh, than there. So you can see that here's the, the government numbers because they started changing how they uh, uh, report it uh, back here. And you can see that they've kind of changed it so it's considerably lower uh, we're talking here, this is probably, you know, eight points uh, lower than it really is. So, <laughs> you know, pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um, Shadow Stats is, 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 is a, a great website to kind of check out. Also shows about the unemployment rate. Um, and you'll see that, that the blue value is, is where it currently is, uh, which is extraordinarily high. Uh, well over 20%, uh, probably about 23% right here. And, you know, on the news, they say, well, you know, it's about 9%. You know, so people don't, don't freak out. But um, you just want to understand this. Now, Ronald Reagan, you know, one of the things that he said is inflation is as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber, and as deadly as a hitman. You know, and, um, and he's right. I mean, what can I say? Now, uh, the value of a 1950s dollar. Okay, here is a chart here, and you can see that a dollar from 1950, okay, which really isn't that long ago, you know, if you think about it. 1950, 2010, that's 60 years, so that's two generations, okay? 88% decline, okay? So it's worth about 12 cents, you know? And, and this is in 2004, okay? From 1950 to 2004, that's 12 cents, 12.3 cents. Now, this is a lot lower now 
um, I've seen similar charts where you know it compares it to um, you know what a dollar was in, in in 1900 or 1901, and I mean it's it's phenomenal. Okay, but this is why you know it's because of inflation that people need to work two jobs because of that and the fractional reserve banking system, and we'll be getting to that in in, uh, in a little bit. But uh, I just wanted to to show you that um, you know, and this also really hurts people who are uh, who are savers you know who want to save money and you know want a, a, a comfortable safe you know type of investment inflation erodes their savings and you know it's it, it's really um, not really too bad now here's a cost of living okay um, if you've seen the uh, uh, the presentation on the elevation group uh, this chart was also in there and you will see over here at the bottom the uh, consumer, you know, price index is like 1.1, 1 .1, okay, uh, in, in year over year change, but you'll see that the real cost of living of things like wheat, corn, you know, heating oil, beef, pork, coffee, sugar, copper, gold, silver, all these things are way up, and this is just one year, okay, this is just one year, and expect these things to to continue and don't think this is that these are very abstract because they're you know futures or they're on the commodities market or anything you know if wheat goes up you know it's directly going to be you know show up in the, in the cost of bread I mean these companies are, are not stupid you know they're gonna pass all that cost on and probably more to you you know because a lot of these companies um, you know uh, you know, are, are just are just going to do that because you're the end consumer. You know, so you're always going to get shafted by uh, by inflation. Inflation, when it first happens, okay, the, the Federal Reserve prints the money, okay, and then gives it to to Congress or the government to use. That's when it still has the most power, okay. As it drifts down, you know, um, you know, the so-called trickle down effect. Inflation starts hitting people who get the money later more and more and more. Okay, so you know there is a time value of money too, and if we're going to be entering into hyperinflation, I mean that becomes even more important. The point I want to point out here is, you know, look at the disparity between the reported numbers and the actual experience. Okay, it's staggering. Okay, if you look at the, the at the at the disparity between the reported numbers and the actual experience of the unemployment numbers it's staggering if you look at the experience between you know uh, uh, what people have and you know what what the what the dollar is worth it's staggering you know and, and that's a point that I want you to understand I mean you know do your own due diligence you know but you know when there is numbers that are specifically distorted you know <laughs> You just got to start asking yourself some questions. All right. So, without getting, uh, without harping on that point, I want to get into what I actually learned from an international bullion dealer. Okay. And this is me and, and Philip Judge uh, from Australia, international bullion dealer. Um, basically, one of the most important things he taught me was was gold is a money of last resort. And what that means, and and, and he relayed this story to me, is you know when. Uh, uh, Germany took over and started, you know, uh, uh, killing Jewish people, and um, uh, you know, really starting to to take in there, and, and the Jewish people started to to flee. The ones that had real assets were the ones that were able to get safe passage out of the country with their lives and their families intact. So people that had gold, okay, people that had silver, um, you know, because when things go to anarchy. It's important to have, you know, gold and silver or any kind of asset that that paper money just doesn't have anymore. You know, the same thing in uh, in Vietnam. You know, in the last days of, of uh, before Saigon uh, fell, you know, the same thing. People that got out had gold and silver. Now it's important to have physical gold and silver in you know at your house, in your property. In my opinion, okay, you don't have to do this, but I think it's a damn good idea. To uh, to have, and I'm glad that, that that Philip you know shared this with me because it's really important. 
And one of the things that I realized is the wealthy people, they look towards assets. If, you're, if we're moving into a, a, a time of high inflation, wealthy people are going to move their money outside of, of paper-denominated assets and into you know, real, hard, tangible assets. And that may be artwork, okay, that you know, is going to be worth, uh, you know, still going to be worth something, you know, even if, even if money goes, uh, isn't worth anything anymore. For example, you know, if you had a drawing by Picasso, you know, would that be worth something if money was like going all to hell? Absolutely. You know, so any kind of collectible, any kind of, you know, physical metal, um, you know, you know, things, things that, that hold their value outside of just being paper. Uh, he also taught me gold is a natural competitor to, competitor to fiat currency, and this is why, you know, the government, you know, really doesn't like it. Um, and you know, we talk about reported numbers. I mean, the 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 uh, what's that place called where, where they have all the gold in the states? The uh, uh, I don't know, some fort. You know, it, it hasn't it hasn't been audited. You know, it hasn't been independently audited. So you know you can you can do your own due diligence about that, but you should be thinking about these things. Um, and one of the reasons it's a natural competitor again is because I said it, it can't be easily manipulated. Now this is pretty interesting. You know, um, Philip told me that less than one ounce per person. If there's six billion people on the on the planet, there's less than four billion ounces that have, of gold that have ever been mined worldwide. A lot of those are not available anymore at any cost. You know they've been uh, they've been used, they've been transferred. They're 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 just not in the system anymore, and you know that's pretty pretty striking. You know when you when you think about it. You know because yeah, it's 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 crazy actually. Now one of the things he said is if you put all the gold that's ever been mined, you know, in one place, you know, it would basically um, wouldn't even fill up a a, a house. Okay, that's how much. Uh, how, how little gold is, and so it is very rare, you know. And this includes all the people that have more than, you know, one ounce. Um, you know, that just means even more people have have less than an ounce. Now, Philip, um, he has a uh, an investment service at uh, Anglo Far East um, that I've used personally, and um, you know, so I just wanted to to kind of let you know that if you want to learn more about uh, about Philip, and you know, that's just a resource that I wanted to uh, to pass along you can do with that with you will what you will but he also said one ounce of gold in the time of Jesus will get you a nice suit you know a, uh, a nice pair of, of leather sandals and a leather belt okay and the same thing you know today and throughout any period of history you could get that now what Mike Diller was talking about in his elevation group is that sometimes the wealth cycles push different asset classes out of uh, out of balance, and that's absolutely true, you know, and that's something you can be profiting from. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about that when we get into the investing with the, uh, you know, with what I mentioned about trends. But it's important to understand that you know uh, you can make changes that will just totally change everything. Okay, that will just totally uh, 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 give you an advantage. Okay, and don't think that that you can't uh, uh, you can't do that. So the wealthy do; uh, they certainly do invest in, in in assets. That's absolutely true. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, where we get into into part two. But before we do that, I just wanted to uh, do a, a poll, and um, you know. Poll must be closed. Okay. So, yeah. So, if you could uh, do a poll, um, do you own any gold or any silver of any kind? Okay. This could be physical gold. This could be, um, you know, maybe a, a stock, maybe a um, anything, you know, even even like a mining stock, you know, let's say, you know, unless it's, it's just in, in some mutual fund that you really don't know, you know, what's there or not, you know, if you actually uh, actually own gold. So, just go through and, and vote. We got about half the people that have voted so far. Just click a yes or no. I certainly would uh, would appreciate it. And then uh, and then we'll be done. So go ahead, keep clicking. 
vote uh, vote yes or no. It's it's anonymous, so uh, you know you don't need to, to to worry about anything like that. Got about 65 percent of the vote in, so we still have uh, about thirty five percent of of the people to uh, to go, and uh, it's starting to uh, starting to get pretty even there. Uh, actually, it's it's exactly even right now. So we've got about sixty nine percent of the vote in. Uh, so you final 30% are going to be the, uh, the ultimate tiebreaker. Okay, so we still got, uh, uh, still got some votes coming in. If you would, just uh, vote yes or no. Okay, we seem to have about 30% uh, that just aren't really voting. So I'm, I'm just going to close this uh, unless you're going to vote now. Okay, so we got about 50-50 um, that, uh, that have gold. So that's pretty interesting. You know, um, I, I think it's probably a lot higher than you'd find in the, in the general population. But you're going to start to see a large swing, you know, towards this. And that's one of the things. You want to be in, in front of the trend. So I'm, I'm glad that you're, you know, on this webinar, that you're taking time, that you're investing. And you're going to see some of that stuff when we get to the, uh, the, the different levels of investors. So part two, the ugly. Okay, um, I knew I didn't have a lot of time to, to kind of go into this, so you know I want to kind of point out some resources for people that that, that want to dig a bit deeper. But I was talking to someone the other day, and you know he said he was a, he was a pretty uh, pretty sophisticated you know investor. And he had never he had never really heard about uh, Jekyll Island, and 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 he didn't realize that you know the Federal Reserve is not federal, nor it's a reserve. It is a private corporation. Okay, it was set up on uh, uh, on Jekyll Island. It was passed in 1913 on Christmas Eve. They railroaded, railroaded the uh, the vote through, and uh, it, it's basically a cartel that's loaning money to you at interest instead of being uh, created by the uh, by the government. And, and that was exactly what people like Thomas Jefferson and 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 uh, you know the founding fathers who wrote the U.S. Constitution were trying to avoid. You know, it, it, they speak. All the time about you know uh, about this. There are some you know very direct quotes in, uh, in movies like uh, like Money is De uh, as Debt um, and things like that that uh, that really speak to that. So here we go. Um, if you want to read more about Jekyll Island, it's it's, it's a pretty fascinating story. Uh, there's a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island, written by this guy. Uh, G. Edward Griffin. It's uh, it's a phenomenal book. I definitely uh, recommend that you, you you check it out. But ultimately, it's a giant Ponzi scheme, okay? Um, and one that I don't know. I mean, it's 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 kind of baffling. I mean, if you ever heard uh, heard Ron Paul talk about it, you know, um, it, it's baffling, you know. But it, it's because people don't really understand about money, um, and and that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to change, and that's why I think. You know, Mike Dillard is is trying to change with uh, with his launch of, of the Elevation Group, uh, which we've been uh, been talking about. So the Constitution, okay, uh, Article One, Section Ten: No state uh, shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Um, and basically, I mean, what what the Constitution was was you know they 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 really wanted to re have the states retain you know their power. Um, you know, as opposed to the uh, to the federal government. Obviously, the federal government has a role, but and they really wanted you know them to to be using real money that could not be manipulated because they went through all of that in the Revolutionary War. You know, with the greenbacks and then the hyperinflation. Um, you know, but it's nothing compared to you know the the things that were around today. And I do wish that I I had had uh, my computer crashed actually a couple of days ago. I'm, I'm doing this on a laptop. Because I had a lot more kind of charts that that went into this that I would love to uh, to share, but I'll be sharing them with my with my newsletter list uh, that I'm my private newsletter list that I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, a little bit a little bit later. Um, I also want to mention that the that the founding fathers were definitely against empire building. Empire building is you know basically the the guns and butter policy like uh, like Rome where they start spending a lot on making the people happy with uh, silly things like in the time of Rome think you know circus think 
uh, gladiators, maybe now think like Jerry Springer, um, you know, just reality TV, I mean, that kind of stuff. And the guns policy, which, you know, in, in the time of Rome was just expanding and, you know, kind of expanding the military until they were overstretched. And the same thing uh, happened here. If you watched uh, the, the Elevation Group presentation, there's one chart where it shows, you know, the GDP, the percent of the, of the GDP spent on, um, on the military. And the U.S. is just off the chart. Now, I mean, the U.S., I mean, there, it's very complex. I, I'm, I don't want to get too political here, but it is very complex. But, you know, let it be said that, um, you know, there is a lot of money that's made in war. And um, a great movie is um, uh, The Fog of War. They, uh, they interview uh, McNamara, Robert McNamara, uh, extensively, who uh, uh, I think was the attorney general after, uh, after Bobby Kennedy was, uh, I'm not sure. But, um, but basically, you know, a lot of this stuff is really just, just funneling money from the taxpayers to private corporations through war, okay? So I, I, know it's, I know it's kind of a little political. I just want to kind of bring that out there, and, you know, you can, you can kind of do your own, uh, own due diligence about this. Now, Thomas Jefferson, you know, he said that, you know, if, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Uh, you know, very clear, uh, you know, in, in, in his words, against, you know, something like uh, the Federal Reserve, okay? And you'll see this. I mean, the Federal Reserve, I mean, you know, they move markets based on what people think Bernanke's going to do or, or what he's not going to do, you know, but, I mean, you know, it's clear with, with a lot of the printing of money that what they're doing is, 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 is that's inflationary. Um, one of the things that, that, that Phil Judge taught me is basically if there, are, if there are like three people in society, okay, and there are, and there's, you know, $30, you know, let's, let's say there's three chickens and then there's $30. So each chicken would be worth $10. Okay, if there's, you know, $3,000, then each chicken's worth $1,000. Okay, that's inflation. There, there's not anything different in that situation other than inflation has come in and, uh, uh, you know, really, really just, just changed the balance. But every single currency um, uh, ha has collapsed, every single fiat currency, because, you know, in the time of Rome, they de they've debased them and added you know, cheaper metals in uh, and putting less and less, you know, gold or, or silver. Um, same thing is happening with, with fiat currency. Okay, it's just, it's just even easier to do because uh, they don't need to print anything. Uh, a great book if, if you're interested in, in what's going on in terms of, uh, uh, you know, empire and, and debt is uh, Bill Bonner's Empire of Debt. Um, you know, uh, you can definitely check that out. Now, here's John, uh, John Maynard Keynes. And uh, what he says is, is there's no subtler, no sure means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic laws on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which not one in a million is able to diagnose. And, you know, that's what's going on right now with all the printing. You know, a lot of people complain about it, um, you know, the bailout and all this stuff. But people don't really understand how it's uh, how it's happening, and it's it's really complex. You know that's why I'm kind of you know pointing to to, to some resources here, uh, Jekyll Island, Empire of Debt, um, you know anything by Thomas Jefferson, you know um, because you want to understand this and you want to be on the side because I mean basically. Uh, this comes back to what we talked over here. Money cannot be created or destroyed. It's going to be transferred. And if you don't understand what's happening, if you don't understand how inflation is attacked, then you're going to get full-on hit by that. If you understand that, that higher inflation is coming, you can move into certain things where it's going to benefit you. You know, when inflation is high, the, the property starts going way up. 
you know, and, and that's something where, you know, you can, uh, you can capitalize on. So the point is, you know, back to the very, very beginning over here, um, you know, the basis is, you know, there are shortcuts to becoming wealthy. There are specific things that you can do and, and you can learn to do. So, you know, I just wanted to, uh, to get onto that. Now, fractional reserve banking, okay? Um, this is a very, very complex subject. And basically, um, all money is, is loaned into existence. Started back when goldsmiths, you know, had kept gold for people rather than kind of walking around with gold and, and, and using it to buy bread and, and stuff like that. They left it at the goldsmiths and they, they got a note that said, hey, you know, this is, you know, cashable for, you know, one-tenth of an ounce of gold at, you know, Joe's goldsmith shop or, or whatever. And, and, and so that's how the notes came in. And basically, you know, some people kept their gold safe, so it was more, you know, easier to do trade and, and, and whatnot. And the goldsmiths realized they could loan out with interest more than they had in, in reserve. Um, and it would work fine until there was a run on the, on, the, on the bank, you know, until everybody took out their money at once. Um, it would work fine. But, uh, so, so it made them money. And here's how it works. You know, let's say you, you, you were to, to, to deposit $100. Banks can loan out, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of nine times at that amount. Um, so they can loan out, you know, about nine hundred dollars in in new money, and that can get deposited in a new bank, and that will, you know, again allow them to, you know, loan out more and more, uh, uh, more and more money. So it becomes fractions of fractions, okay, and you know, with all this money. The fractional reserve banking system is, is, is pretty pretty hard to explain in words, okay? Um, it's much easier to explain it in terms of visuals. There's a great animated film called Money as Debt, uh, which is absolutely phenomenal. But basically, you know, with all this stuff, with all these advantages that, that, that people, that the banks had, okay, because people like you and me who get a mortgage from a bank owe real interest on that money that they created out of thin air, um, you know, and still they got themselves into, into such a bad mess that they need to be bailed out by guess who? Well, they, by you and me, you know, the, the taxpayers. Um, you know, so they got to take all the risk, uh, make all the money, and then when it came due, uh, then, you know, they don't even need to take responsibility of it. So, you know, it's it, it's pretty crazy, but it's it's really you know what you what you have to understand. You know, if you want to make money, and and I don't want to kind of harp too much on on the negatives here because you know there's a lot of things you can do to to really make money, but the main purpose or the main point that I want to make is that with fractional reserve banking and with the, with the current system of of the Federal Reserve, you know, it creates more debt that can ever be repaid. If every single dollar was rounded up you know, there would be more money owed than there is in, in existence. Okay, so it's, it's, it's like a Ponzi scheme. I mean, it just doesn't make sense, but, you know, it's, it's, it's basically making, uh, uh, creating more debt. And that's why, you know, now as opposed to one or two generations ago, you really need two people working, you know, um, and, and most families, have two people working and have a babysitter so people aren't with the kids, you know, and all that kind of stuff, um, which, you know, is going to lead to other social problems um, because, you know, of all the latchkey kids and, and people are being raised by um, uh, at daycare instead of their parents, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's very complex. Um, but what I want to do is I want to, you know, let's stop the disempowering part. That's why I call this the ugly. And get into some some real critical thoughts of, of investors before we get to the seven different levels of investors. So, investing is a zero sum game. What that means is that when you're doing investments, okay, basically, if someone uh, if someone makes you know five thousand dollars, someone else is going to lose five thousand dollars. Okay, so for every some every person that wins. There's a, a there's a counterpoint where someone loses. Okay, a lot of people don't realize this, and you know this is why it's it's kind of crazy to just you know buy a mutual fund and just you know kind of hope for the best because people that understand this are gonna just 
rip it right off of you. Um, so investing, okay? I started investing in, in, in 2008. Um, <laughs> great time to, uh, to start, eh? But, you know, I certainly learned a lot about it because it was, you know, I attacked it with the same intensity that I attacked, you know, becoming a network marketer and learning internet marketing. I just dug my heels in and, you know, wouldn't give up until I, until I succeeded. So, you know, mindset, you really have to conquer mindset. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty important. I mean, that's the most important thing about investing. You know, you have to have the right mindset. I think that some people just really don't have the, the mindset, particularly for investing in stocks. Um, you know, and, and there are things that you can do, but basically you have to understand that um, investing is kind of like gambling, and, and you only gamble when the odds are in your favor. Okay, I, I never gamble when I go to Vegas. You know, I'm not, I'm not a gambler. I, I don't know. I just, I just don't do it. You know, I certainly don't play the, uh, the lottery. Um, that's another thing where it's, it's just a hidden tax on the people who, you know, probably hurts the most. Um, you know, but gambling with, with your odds in, in your favor. And if you gamble with the odds in your favor, and you're consistent, you're going to win. You're going to come out ahead, right? And, and that's what you can do. Okay. Um, so again, you know, as a counterpoint to the very beginning, there are shortcuts to, to, to being wealthy and you can and you can copy what they do and you can and you can you know be a, an advantage. A um, good principle is is trend following. Always trade in the direction of the overall market. And you can look at you know the, the, the 50 day simple moving average or or something very basic like that. Um, you know, just to know which way the market is 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 going. Um, and follow that trend. And if you're and if you're following that you know, then you're probably going to be successful. Uh, sideways markets where it's choppy, it's going up and down, there's no clear direction, you know, consider moving out of the market, particularly if you don't want to keep your eye on, on, on what's going on because you're going to be whipsawed, you know, out and, 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 and in and out. Um, so this is probably the, the hardest market to, to make money in, okay, even harder than, than a downward market. A downward market, if it's clear and it's going down, you know, it's consistently going down, you can make money. The trick with the downward market is, you know, prices tend to go fall faster than they than they rise. Um, definitely learn to short. Learn to short stocks. You know, it's counterintuitive, but do it a couple times to get used to it. You know, you should be able to do this in your. Um, I don't know if you can do it in your four hundred one k. I think you can do it in a Roth IRA or in Canada. Um, you know, or if you can't, then you can get an ETF or an exchange traded fund that, you know, is a short. I wouldn't do too much of the inverse things, you know, again, because, you know, you're dealing with, with more risk and until you really know what you're doing, you know, just, just kind of test it out. But after you short a couple times, you know, it's like everything else. You know, the first time you do something that's difficult, you're like, whoa, am I doing this right? And then you get it and, you can, and then you can go on. Number six, you have to remove your emotion from trading. Okay, greed and fear are magnified, okay, particularly in investing. It's kind of like, you know, you, you go into a place where you're going to be tempted. You know, you open Pandora's box. They're magnified. So you've got to be prepared for that. Um, you know, the thing with investing is shorter time frames equals more randomness. So, you know, people will talk about different, different charts, you know, like a weekly chart, a daily chart, a hourly chart, you know, five-minute chart. You know, the shorter the time frame, the more randomness. You know, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really recommend that, and particularly when you're starting out. Start with a longer time frame. Uh, value investing, okay, value versus growth investing, okay, the, the, the two main schools of, of thought. Value investing is basically where you buy something that's undervalued, uh, that's, that's down, that's beaten down, that people don't want, and you, know, you have a long-term uh, 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 view for that. It's very difficult for non-professionals to do because you have a lot of confidence in your in your position because you're picking stocks that are that have been kicked down, okay, that are that are not wanted. It's much easier to do growth investing, in my opinion, where you 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 buy high and you sell higher, uh, something like the uh, Can Slim method, C A N S L I M, uh, that that uh, William William O'Neill uh, started, and um, yeah, so value investing uh, depends on consistency over multiple years. Okay, that's important. Um, I would suggest read multiple books, find a philosophy that that, that matches yours. Um, there's three main 
you know, types of, of, of trading. Uh, there's day trading, which I, I certainly don't recommend. Uh, there's swing trading, which is where you hold things from a few days, you know, to a few weeks. And then there's, you know, buy and hold, which is more long term. And, you know, you can do certain things. I mean, you know, if you're looking at the bigger picture and you want to buy and hold, you know, if you buy something like, let's say, gold or, or oil now and you have a long-term time frame, you know, you have a lot of time where you can be very successful with that. So, you know, and, and, and it's, if you have the odds in your favor, if you think, you know, is oil going to be more expensive a year from now, you know, than it is today, then, you know, you have the odds in your favor. You know, and if you're and the more confident that you are about that, the better your odds are. So it, it's really all about the odds, and then and then really you know sticking with it and, and doing that. But the, the the black box with investing, the thing you need to be careful of is how much time you want to spend time monitoring your investments. You know, consider your lifestyle and the stress it's going to bring you as well. You know, because swing trading may, might be the best in terms of profitability, but are you going to be able to keep that up? Is it going to give you too much? Uh, uh, trouble sleeping at night because there are different ways that you can invest, you know, that, that are not going to give you that same, uh, those same problems. All right. So now we're going to get to the uh, seven levels of, uh, of investors. Okay. And um, basically, uh, uh, okay. So non-existent. And this is, this is from um, uh, adaptive from, uh, from John Budwig. Uh, non non-existent borrowers are are the ostriches, are non-existent investors. They're the, they're the head in the sand. They just don't make enough money. You know, they'll they don't have any investments. They're not going to do anything. Um, you know, with that, you know, they're just going to put their head in the sand and 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 you know, really kind of uh, uh, you know, hope for the best. And they're not going to make uh, not going to make any money. Uh, that is something that you need to you know, uh, 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 to avoid and, and move beyond. Okay, these people don't do any investing. The borrower, okay, they know how to consume, and their idea of financial planning is, you know, getting a new Visa card or, or refinancing. So they're going to borrow. They know how to spend, but they don't really have anything in savings. They don't have anything in their, in their Roth IRA. They don't have a, uh, their RSP. They don't have their 401K. And then there's the saver. Okay, the saver is the next day job, and, and these are, you know, kind of consecutive. Uh, the saver, you know, you, they save a small amount on a regular basis, which is great. You know, they usually go to yo, uh, low yield, low risk things like checking savings account, money market, CDs, or guaranteed investments. Guaranteed investments, I mean, come on, <laughs> it's guaranteed. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, that should be a, a warning sign for you. Uh, this may have worked before the depression, you know, before money was devalued, you know, and uh, uh, before it was inflated, but it doesn't work now. Okay, so if this is you, you need to increase your level and and, and get beyond that. And that's that's the thing. I mean, you know, you, these aren't static. I mean, you can move beyond this, and people need to go through every level, generally speaking, until they uh, 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 consecutively. Um, so that's interesting, you know. So if you're here, you can go here, and, and, and so it's a process, it's a journey. The passive investor, uh, they regularly invest in traditional investments. You know, this is like middle class. Uh, they're financially illiterate. They don't really understand a lot about, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, financial terms, that kind of thing. And there, there's two main types. There's the head in the sand, you know, who say. You know, oh, it's too complicated. I'm going to leave it to my accountant. They're going to handle it. You know, uh, give it to someone else. I just, I'm just not cut out for this type of thing, and it can't be done. Okay, and these are the people who basically say, oh, you know, 10% per year returns are impossible. You know, 20% is 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 crazy. It can't be done. You know, they generally invest in, in indexes, and these people in particular have have would you know would have a lot to 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 gain from you know being able to uh, to move to the uh, to the next level. So if you're in this class, the passive inve investor, you know making that transition to moving up is uh, is is pretty important. Automatic investor. Uh, this person actually can become wealthy. Okay, this is the first level where you can actually start generating some real wealth. 
Um, and they're active and they're automatic about their investments. These are like the millionaire, millionaire next door type, uh, the book by Thomas J. Stanley. Um, they don't do mar you know, have margins on their stocks. They don't have fancy investments. They basically use the power of compound interest and consistency. And notice that I've kind of bolded the word consistency because it's pretty important <laughs> um, in, in a lot of things, in internet marketing and this, um, you know, very, very important. Next level up is the active investor. Um, you know, they're actively involved in the optimization of their portfolio. They're looking for 20 to 100% returns. Um, and, and, and that's what they, they generally achieve. And they understand that rich people work hard to have their money work hard. They work hard so that their money can work hard. The middle class work hard for their money. Okay, and there's a huge difference for that. And this is someone who would be like uh, uh, like someone who's in the, uh, 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 you know, if they took a shortcut, they'd be in the, the elevation group, something like that. Because, you know, they can, they can get these higher returns and really have their money working hard for them. And, you know, they're, they're actively involved in, 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 in growing their income rather than just kind of sitting and, and, and hoping. And that's important. And so they're interested in increasing their assets and increasing their, their cash flow. And the last level, and you can be very wealthy at this stage, the last level is, is capitalists. There's people that, that create self-perpetuating generational wealth, okay? So people that have set up grants, foundations, uh, family banks, you know, uh, like the Rockefeller Foundation and, and uh, things like that, and uh, uh, philanthropy. So what I want you to do is, is to kind of put yourself in, in, in one of these uh, categories. You know, where are you right now? Uh, non-existent, borrower, are you a saver? Are you a passive investor? Are you an automatic investor? or an active investor, or, uh, or a capitalist. So those are the different seven levels of, uh, uh, of investors. And you should be able to pinpoint immediately where you are. And I want you to do that now, and I want you to write that down on, on a piece of paper just for your own private reference. Because we're right here at the end of the year. And another year from now, you, know, you can look back and kind of see where you are and see if you made a difference. And um, I think that's that's important, you know, for, for people to do that. Particularly if you have a, if you have a calendar for next year already, you know, write this in at the beginning, and, and, and then you know, mark a note on the on the thirty first to review where you are and, and if you change on your seven levels of uh, of investors. Um, here are some action steps for you, because uh, you know we've gone over an hour, and I do want to um, uh, you know give some uh, uh, give some time to do this. All right, but uh, what you want to do is you want to join, uh, join mint.com. Uh, it, it certainly is free uh, to do. And um, yeah, you know, it will keep an eye on your, uh, on your finances, uh, which is so important. Okay, uh, number two, Calculate your net worth. Uh, that's really important as well. Uh, you know, definitely do that. And uh, yeah, so definitely do that. Um, the Elevation Group. You do want to join the, uh, the Elevation Group. Uh, there is a tour where you can kind of see what's in the Elevation Group uh, at andrewmurrayhq.com forward slash EVG tour. Okay. Um, and you have to understand there are different ways to improve. You know, you can make mistakes or you can leverage from other people's knowledge. Those are the two things that, uh, that you can do to improve where you are right now. But understand that wealthy people do things differently. Um, you know, for example, I mean, hedge funds are, are only open to accredited investors, people who have, you know, X million dollars of, of net worth. Um, in a lot of cases, suckers are, are the ones who, who buy uh, mutual funds. It's basically like the speedboat versus the ocean liner. The speedboat is a trader with a trend follower. Um, you know, the mutual fund is, is the ocean liner. And the ocean liner can never keep pace of that, um, uh, can never have the same kind of dexterity and, and keep on top of, of what's going on as a speedboat can. Um, and, you know, when it comes to money, being average is being 
poor. So, uh, uh, so it is important. Now, basically, what you want to do is, is you want to go to the uh, to the tour. Uh, I'm going to finish off here by you know talking about some of the uh, bonuses that uh, uh, that we have here for joining the Elevation Group. The first is Habits of the Wealthy. Uh, this is the uh, Habits of the Wealthy. Uh, holding it right here, the CD. I'm going to ship you this uh, this DVD um, for uh, for joining the the Elevation Group. Uh, second is this money webinar that we're doing right now. Um, I'm going to give you a, a, a digital copy of this. Uh, finally, we got private sources for offshore banking and for investing in gold. I'm going to tell you what where where I do my stuff um, and let you you know uh, uh, do that. Uh, third or fourth rather, I'm going to give you my private wealth newsletter. Now this is my own little mini. Elevation Group, uh, something I'm going to be starting in, in, in 2011, where I'm going to be, you know, weighing in once a month and really telling a little bit about, you know, where I think the economy is going, what I think is happening, and um, uh, and that kind of stuff. And uh, Melt Up DVD, I'm going to give you a copy of uh, of this a digital copy of the, the Melt Up DVD. Great movie. Um, it's not a great, uh, not a great uh, uh, cover, but basically talks about, you know, hyperinflation. And uh, what you want to do to prepare for that. Um, I'm also going to be giving away a webinar on how to promote the Elevation Group, so you can make money by promoting this long term. Because I think that's going to be one of the best passive income streams. And uh, I'm also going to be giving away my marketing funnels and marketing material that I create for myself about marketing the Elevation Group, and let you piggyback on that. And, uh, and and ride this uh, ride this to the top with me. So, you know, I I, I hope that uh, you know this has been a great webinar. Um, hear my dogs uh, starting to howl in the background. So I guess that means uh, I'm I'm over time. But what I want you to do is I want you to go here. I want you to go to andrewmurrayhq.com forward slash evg tour. And you can actually get a tour of what's in the back office of the Elevation Group. See it for yourself. And uh, if you're not a part already of the Elevation Group, uh, I would really encourage you to do that because you know uh, this is your way to kind of capitalize and, and piggyback on on uh, what's going to be uh, what's going to help you get there um, and and become successful. So if you do have any questions, uh, you know, shoot me over an email. Get in contact with me. And I will get back to you as soon as possible. And uh, I certainly appreciate all of you being on the uh, on the webinar. And I will talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.